Hello, my name is Brian Yellen. I live in Amherst, Massachusetts. I'm a geologist at UMass Amherst. And one of the things that I study is how rivers change over time and how rivers shape the landscape. Um, so today we'll be going to Amethyst Brook, um, both the brook and the conservation area named after it. And I'm standing here at the entrance to Amethyst Brook at this lovely Mutt Mitt station. Um, this is one of the best things we can do for our rivers. Um, one of the leading contaminants of our rivers around here is pet waste. This is a really popular dog park and everything we can do to keep um, dog poop out of our streams, um, I'm fully in support of. Um, so today I'll take you to a series of sites down to Amethyst Brook. We'll see some places where the brook is eroding material, places where it's depositing sediment, and ways that rivers um, move and create new habitats throughout the forested landscape. Before we head off to the sites in the field, I'd like to highlight the geography of where we'll be going. This is the Amethyst Brook Conservation Area as mapped by Kestrel. You'll notice the area to the left of the screen is maintained by the town of Amherst, and there's a darker green parcel to the right, which has been preserved by Kestrel Land Trust. I'll be proceeding from the parking area over to the Amethyst Brook itself, and to the east or toward the right of the screen, upstream um, toward the eastern edge of the Kestrel parcel. The Amethyst Brook, the blue line running down the middle of the screen, runs from right to left or from east to west. I'll be stopping at these five sites, an alluvial fan, which is the middle of a farm field today, a log jam that's built in the stream, and we'll learn about why log jams are important for stream ecology. Then we'll proceed to number three, a place where this wide bend in the river is being cut off by a new channel that's forming. Next, at stop four, we'll see what is a historical canal or mill race. And last, at the most upstream location, we'll see the abutments for an old mill called Allen Mill, which is right across the Pelham line. Crucial to understanding the geology of this area is understanding the deglaciation of the area. As the ice sheet retreated from New England, you can see the ice sheet depicted here at the top of the screen, it left behind lots and lots of sediment. And that sediment forms the basis of all of our soils and many of our landforms here in New England. Here you can see lots of sources of sediment, rivers bringing sediment down into a lake. This is similar to the large glacial lake that filled the Connecticut River Valley from south of Hartford all the way up into northern New England. This lake, also known as Glacial Lake Hitchcock, in Amherst was about 275 or 290 feet above sea level. Rivers bringing sediment into the lake would drop their sediment. The coarsest sediment, like sand and gravel, would settle out relatively quickly and form these large flat areas right at the, where the bedrock meets the lake. You can see several large flat areas forming, and these are what we call proglacial deltas. Out in the middle of the lake, only the finest material like clays and silts could make it that far. Today, much of the Connecticut River Valley adjacent to the Connecticut River has been covered by another layer of what we call alluvial sediment or modern sediment from the flooding Connecticut River. And that's what makes up the rich, rich farmland adjacent to the Connecticut River. But today we'll be focusing on these marginal areas on the side of the lakes that form these coarse grained deltas made up of sand and gravel and the lake sediment out in the middle of the lakes. So here is the Amethyst Brook area as depicted in a superficial geologic map. You can see the Amethyst Brook running from uh, right to left or from east to west across the bottom half of the screen. Pelham Road is along the bottom edge of the screen. And the different colors represent different glacial soils. The top color, that periwinkle in the key, is lake bed material, typically clay. And you can see a, a band of clay running down the middle of this image. The next color down on the key, the yellow, represents modern alluvial sediment, sediment being deposited by modern rivers. 
The next color down, that olive green, is an alluvial fan. In the middle of Amethyst Brook Conservation Area is a big alluvial fan. And what this is, is a sort of lens-shaped or concave downward-shaped landform that was formed by the catastrophic deposition of lots and lots of sediment when Glacial Lake Hitchcock drained. The next one down the key, that orange color, represents that sandy glacial delta material. A glacial delta extended from the north all the way to the south edge of this screen. It has been bisected today by the modern Amethyst Brook. As the glacial lake drained, Amethyst Brook cut down through that delta, forming the big alluvial plain just to the west of the delta. This alluvial plain leads the landscape around Amethyst Brook to actually slope away from the brook itself. And I'll highlight this at one of the sites. Moving down the, the key, next one is the red hash marks. This corresponds to glacial till. And the lowest one is ledge or bedrock, places where rock is, being, is exposed at the surface. One great way to study the glacial history or the landforms of the area is through something called LIDAR. The image here is a combination of, of two different ways of showing LIDAR data. But first I should explain what LIDAR is. LIDAR is a very high precision topographic map and it's produced by flying an airplane with a laser mounted on the bottom or a series of lasers bouncing lasers off the ground and measuring the time it takes for those lasers to, to return to the plane. The, the pulse that takes the longest to return is the bare earth. Um, and so it can effectively see through all the trees and see the shape and con contours of the earth. And so here we can see farm fields that pop out as really smooth features. And one of the most obvious feature is that big glacial delta at the eastern edge of the screen. It's sort of a rosy pink color and that rosy pink color corresponds to the elevation, that 280 to 290 foot elevation. And you can see that delta has been bisected by Amethyst Brook, going from the right to the left side of the screen. Coming from the north edge of the map is Adams Brook. And Adams Brook and Amethyst Brook come together in the southwest corner of the map, so in the bottom left corner. And where Adams Brook and Amethyst Brook combine, it becomes the Fort River. Fort River Elementary School in Amherst is just off the lower left edge of the map. Without further ado, we'll get to our field sites. So this is our first stop on our tour of Amethyst Brook's geology. Um, we're out in the middle of this pasture or field at the entrance to the Amethyst Book Conservation Area. And what's unique about this area is it's probably going to be impossible to tell from the video, but if you come here in person, you'll notice that from the river, away from the river, as you move away from the river, the landscape actually slopes downhill. And the reason for that is that we're standing on an alluvial fan. And what an alluvial fan is, is a big pile of sediment that was deposited really quickly and it was deposited not into a lake, but across um, a, a dry landscape, um, or what geologists call subaerially, below air, as opposed to subaqueous, below water. So this was, a, a, was deposited below air. Again, it's called an alluvial fan. The material here you'd expect to be quite coarse, sandy, gravelly material. Indeed, the town community garden is just behind us. And in the community garden, you'll find lots of well-rounded sort of baseball sized rocks and that's an indication that this area was deposited rather um, quickly um, and it, it's the result of the re redeposition or remobilization of some previously deposited river material at a much higher level. The previously deposited material was part of Glacial Lake Hitchcock's um, a, a, a small river delta built out into Glacial Lake Hitchcock when the lake drained the river cut down through that and quickly deposited this alluvial fan. And again, what, what's unique about the landscape now is that it now slopes away from the river. It's sort of this convex um, shape that slopes slightly away from the river. You can't see it here uh, in person that clearly, but if you sort of squint, you can see the landscape drops by about three to four feet across this field. Now I'm standing 
in the middle of Amethyst Brook, the brook for which this conservation area is named. It's a beautiful cold water stream. What I mean by cold water is that um, even throughout the summer, it stays cold enough to maintain um, species that can only survive in water below about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the most uh, charismatic of these species is the brook trout. Um, it's the only trout that's native to New England. Um, we have many other trout species in our rivers today, but they've all been introduced from the western U.S. and from Europe. Um, so again, this is one that still hosts native brook trout. Um, part of the reason for that is this beautiful hemlock cover um, that shades the stream really well. Forests play a really important role in maintaining stream temperature, but forests do more than that. They also impact the shape of rivers. They, of course, control erosion on the bank um, and allow rivers to stay within their banks. The other thing they do is they provide large wood that drops into the stream and is a real benefit to the streams. Now, this might look messy. This might look like a disaster. You might see this and say, oh no, the stream's been ruined by all this tree, these trees that have fallen into it and all this wood. Nothing could be further from the truth. This wood is really great for the stream. Um, so this particular log jam was caused by a tree that used to be sitting just to my left here. Um, the river undercut it, probably aided in part um, by humans using this trail as well as dogs coming down into the river. Um, but eventually, it's likely this tree would have gone regardless of human interaction. The tree fell across the river. It trapped lots of large wood. That large wood trapped smaller wood. It trapped sediment. And it created a great deal of habitat diversity. Um, from this vantage point, I can see very fine sand and silt river bottom. I can see large boulder river bottom. I can see a deep pool here with moving water as well as a deep pool with rather still water. This type of habitat diversity is ideal. It's what we want to find in a natural stream. Um, oftentimes in human engineered landscapes, we remove all the wood, um, we straighten river channels. This is the absolute opposite of this. This is a, a river in a really nice natural condition. And what that leads to is a lot of habitat diversity and a lot of opportunities for different um, river dwellers to find those different habitat niches within the stream. A really important concept in understanding how rivers shape the landscape is the idea of base level. Base level describes the elevation below which a river can no longer erode. The ultimate base level is sea level. When rivers get to the ocean, they can't erode down because the ocean slows down their velocity and that's the way that they do erosion. Instead, what happens at the ocean is we typically get deposition. Think of large deltas forming into the ocean, like the, like the delta of the Mississippi River in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, this was not a delta right here, but this forest was controlled by a base level. I'm standing on a really flat surface here that was deposited um, by Amethyst Brook at a certain base level. Now, what's interesting is right behind me, there's a small escarpment. The landscape jumps up about five or six feet and above that it becomes very flat again. If you were to dig down here you would find that these flat surfaces are not solid rock, they're comprised of soil or sediments deposited by Amethyst Brook um, over the last several thousand years. These different levels is what, are what geologists call terraces and they're evidence of changing base levels throughout time. That higher terrace is older, it represents a time when Amethyst Brook was about uh, five or six feet above my head and depositing at that level. Since then, Amethyst Brook base level was lowered by some control downstream of here. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but it's something that uh, was eroded away and allowed Amethyst Brook to cut down to a lower level and establish this new floodplain and lower terrace level. So multiple terraces created throughout the landscape are a function of changing base level. And it's a really important uh, feature of the New England landscape the vast majority of our farms, of our development, of our houses are built on these variable terrace levels. Typically the lowest terrace level is still flooding today and not a good place to build, um, but some of the higher terrace levels um, are commonly built on. So now I'm standing on the lowest terrace level present at Amethyst Brook. This is the active floodplain, or in the case of, of Amethyst Brook, the active grade plain of the river. 
And when I say braid plane, what I mean is this river is sort of a braid, has a braided morphology. There are multiple channels at certain places. Part of the reason for that, that braided morphology or those multiple channels is the alluvial fan that it's cutting through. Because the alluvial fan is sort of this domed shape, it allows the river to flow in multiple different directions. We can see evidence of a new channel that's forming right here. Um, I'm standing right at what's called the active head cut. During high flows, some of the river water comes through this channel right here. Today, it's not flowing. Instead, Amethyst Brook goes in a wide sweeping arc behind me. Um, and this small channel through here is sort of a straight line that cuts off that broad sweeping bend in the river. Um, during high flows, the river is actively cutting down into this channel. And as this head cut moves upstream, eventually this channel will likely capture all of Amethyst Brook. It'll become the active channel and establish a new epoch or new period of braiding around. These are geologic processes that happen on the order of decades to hundreds of years. They're really rapid in the, in the world of geology. Many things in geology take millions or billions of years. This is an example of something where we can really see it happening over the course of a lifetime, or maybe even the course of just one big storm event. Um, so pay attention to this head cut here at Amethyst Brook. Who knows, maybe in the next big extreme flood, um, we'll see the head cut advance far enough to capture all of the river's flow, and this will become the active channel, and the present day active channel will become a, a, a relic um, channel meander cutoff. I'm standing now at one of the many riffles here on Amethyst Brook. A riffle is a place where the river drops rather steeply. You'll tend to find large cobbles and boulders in it, um, and lots of turbulent water. Great habitat for a variety of insects. Um, and Amethyst Brook is a classic example of pool and ripple morphology. And what that means is there are places where the river surface is flat and the water tends to be a little bit deeper and slower, and then it goes into a ripple. And then it flattens out into a pool and down into a ripple. Very um, archetypal New England river morphology and a morphology you'll find all throughout the world in places of intermediate slopes. At our steepest slopes, we tend to just have waterfalls, and on our flattest slopes, we tend to have meandering rivers. In this transition zone is where we find our pool and ripple morphology. Now, one thing that's really interesting about this location, here on this alluvial fan that's represented by, by, by Amethyst Brook Conservation Area, um, there's a really strange feature. And it's, an, it's a ditch here that was excavated by someone at some point, and I'm not sure when, but I'd like to take you up that ditch. So here I am standing in the ditch, and you may not be able to tell from the film, but this is definitely not a natural stream channel. It's perfectly straight, and also it slopes away from the river. It's sloping down away from the river. Someone excavated this to take some of the river's flow and bring it off, um, in this case, quite a distance away from the brook itself. In some places, this ditch gets as far as maybe a third to a half of a mile away from Amethyst Brook. I'm not sure what the ditch was created for. It's over a mile long, and it stretches all the way down along Amherst Pelham Road, and eventually rejoins with Amethyst Brook, close to where uh, the, uh, Amethyst Brook or Fort River goes under Amherst Pelham Road, if you're familiar with the local geography. Again, I'm not sure what it was used for, but I followed it this morning for, for several hundred yards, and in many places, the, the down, the, the, the berm on the right has been built up very obviously. Someone spent a lot of time building this. I'm not sure if it was built to run a mill or if it was built for irrigation, but it's a really fascinating aspect of the landscape and something you could only see built on alluvial fan. It's very difficult to create a ditch going downhill away from a river in most contexts in New England. Another thing in making this site really unique and interesting. We're now standing on, on the edge of another eroding cut bank. Um, erosion is part of the river process. In this case, the erosion is probably being aided um, by access to the river here, especially by dogs. Um, this is a really popular place to swim dogs. Um, finally, the hemlocks that were and the white pines that were overhanging the bank here have fallen down. Um, definitely not a net negative for the river. This large wood in the river is creating great habitat um, and a really interesting um, heat pool behind it. Um, one thing that is unfortunate, of course, 
is dog poop right on the edge of the river here. Dog poop is one of the, the leading contaminants of the river. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a volunteer with Fort River Watershed Association. Amethyst Brook is one of the main tributaries to the Fort River. And we've been testing water quality uh, in, in, at Amethyst Brook and Groff Park this summer. Um, and we do see elevated levels of bacteria. One of, the, one of the leading causes is likely pet waste. So now I'm standing all the way at the upstream end of Amethyst Brook Conservation Area, actually just, just upstream of where the conservation area ends, um, where Kestrel has a parcel in this region. Um, the river upstream of here, off to my left, um, it comes out of the steep part of the hills, a relatively confined area. This is where um, about 14,000 years ago, the land surface would have been well above my head, some two, 300, 200 feet or so above my head, representing the top of this sandy delta built out into glacial Lake Hitchcock. Lake Hitchcock drained um, about 14,000 years ago. It was dammed way down in Connecticut, south of Hartford. When that dam broke, glacial Lake Hitchcock drained, not all at once, but um, in a series of stages. And as it did, Amethyst Brook cut down through these sandy deltas, um, forming the alluvial fan. Upstream of here, you can see big bedrock and ledge forming the side of the stream. And so what that did was it made it a really great place to build mill dams. You can see here behind me the abutments of one of these mill dams. I believe this was one called the Allen Mill. Um, upstream of here, there are four more mills in close proximity. The furthest one up uh, is called the Montague the Montague Fishing Rod Factory. It's not in Montague, it's in Pelham. It's right on, across the Amherst-Pelham line. And it's a place where they were manufacturing bamboo fishing rods from about 1880 to 1920. This dam was in existence until, I think, 2014. In the 1940s and 50s, it was the Pelham Public Swimming Area. Um, since then, it had completely filled with sediment and was no longer being used as a public swimming area. In 2014, I think, or thereabouts, the dam was removed. Um, and since then, fish that migrate up from the ocean have been observed already migrating into the river upstream of that dam. It's been a really successful project in terms of restoring critical cold water habitat. Um, and um, just one of many examples of, of sort of the interaction between human history and natural history here at Amethyst Brook.